Uh, morning. Uh, welcome everyone to our fifth uh, at leisure webinar. Fifth, as I was re reliably told about 20 seconds ago, I had to count them up. Thanks for coming. Um, I hope you're all able to benefit this morning from an interesting discussion uh, as we focus this month on our pub sector. Um, I haven't seen a huge amount of coverage in the last few years. Um, my name is Ollie Steer Fowler. I'm the head of leisure property at Vickery Holman, property consultant, uh, and I will be your uh, host for the webinar as usual today. Um, I'd like to say that this time round, you'll be seeing less of me because we have our resident pub expert uh, asking the majority of the questions this time around, um, who I'll introduce to you later on. Uh, I'm sure that there's plenty of us within the uh, audience this morning who are very keen to get back to our beloved pubs. Um, and both M Mike and I know actually from speaking to a number of publicans um, and property owners how desperate they are to be reopening again um, from the 12th of April. Uh, outside only for the for the meantime all being well but uh, looking forward to the summer um, and getting back to, to to trading as close to normal as possible um looking at the delegates list this morning there's a few people that i recognize um and we've got a really really good uh sign up number this morning we've had over 90 sign ups for this episode um which i think gives you an, an idea really of the interest in the pub sector um and you know perhaps indicates people's appetite for it to reopen really um many thanks for taking part uh, live today and everyone please do join in where possible using the chat panel on the right hand side of your screen um when we are able at the end of the webinar if we've got five ten minutes still left over from our contributors talking we will try as best as we can to get to your questions on the right hand side so please do post that in there whether that's for me mike or any of our contributors this morning um that would be fab uh, the purpose of the webinar, um, as per the title, really, is to engage uh, this morning, in a, as, as usual with the At Leisure series, in a conversational way um, and look at how the pub sector is faring, um, focusing, of course, uh, on where we're based down here in the southwest mainly, but also looking from, from a national perspective as well um, with our contributors this morning. Um, all of, you know, our contributors, all of whom are, are working at the sharp end of the sector on a macro scale, or, or business owners in their own right. So we'll then take a look at the upcoming year, what's in store, um, how COVID-19 is, is currently affecting operators and, and what our guests think will be the way forward for our pubs in 2021 now that we've got a roadmap that we can hopefully stick to. So to start things off this morning, I'd like to introduce my uh, co-partner in crime, uh, my colleague, Mike Easton, who is our resident pubs expert, as previously mentioned. Um, Mike, if you'd like to check the screen. Um, Mike is our head of hotels and hospitality uh, and part of our growing leisure team here at Vickery Holman. Uh, Mike, you've had a busy start to the year um, with completions already, I think, from an agency perspective on the pub front. So um, I think it's safe to say this webinar comes at a good time. Uh, as we look forward to our pubs reopening. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I mean, it's quite telling uh, that last year, once lockdown one finished, we had a lot of pent up demand actually, and there was a big bounce back in how people were viewing um, hotels, hospitality. Um, I think that started pretty much in self catering, moved on to hotels, and, and then bounced over to pubs, where I think at a point last year, people were quite downbeat. and. We've seen a bit of a sea change. We've had lots of people that want to get into the industry. I think everyone's quite confident of the year ahead. I think we're also quite confident for the next couple of years if this happens. Um, so, yeah, we, we've had a few completions. Um, biggest problem has been stock, and it's been stock across the board. But, um, yeah, from a marketing perspective, as you say, this is number five. And I think we get more and more upbeat as we get closer and closer to, uh, to reopening, basically. Yeah. There's that finish line that we're just desperate to get to where, um, you know, hopefully now with with Boris setting out this roadmap, we can stick to it. Um, we've got past the first hurdle yesterday. My beloved golf course is reopened. Um, so, you know, we, it, phase one is is we're, we're past that line and that's that's opened as planned. Let's hope that we can get there for, for certainly the 12th of April is the first big milestone. for Yeah, very much so. Uh, and I think, funnily enough, at the end of the session today, um, we've got a, a lovely background from one of our contributors that I think the whole audience will enjoy. We, yeah, certainly better than my background okay. anyway. <laughs> Cheers, Mike. We'll hear more from Mike later on. Um, I'd uh, now like to introduce the, our first guest contributor this morning, if possible, um, Kate Nichols. So Kate is the uh, Chief Executive of UK Hospitality and has very, very kindly agreed to join us for this morning's webinar uh, and share some thoughts with us on the pub sector. Um, 
thanks for, for being here this morning, Kate. And uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself to our audience and uh, share with us what, what you've been up to uh, and doing recently at UK Hospitality from a national standpoint, that'd be great. Oh, you're muted. Join Kate, you. Um, so UK Hospitality, for those of you who don't know, we're the national trade body that represents hospitality operators and employers. And we cover everything from pubs, bars, hotels, restaurants, visitor attractions, uh, coffee shops, so the whole breadth of hospitality operators. We have 700 member companies. Between them, they operate 90,000 outlets, and it's everything from a single site independent pub right the way through to the largest national chains. And it's that strength that we get from having that breadth and depth of representation, which means that, that we are, are the voice of the industry when we go in to talk to government. And in particular, over the course of COVID, we've been the main point of contact for government in discussing what's what's happening with the hospitality sector and trying to get a um, a better package of support for the industry. Uh, so our role is, is sort of threefold. We're, we're there to promote the, the positives of the industry as a great place to grow, work and invest. We're there to protect our members' interests. We provide them with insight, intelligence, consumer insight, but also risk management, so corporate risk scanning, looking at the horizon. And then we're also there to prevent uh, the imposition of the unnecessary costs of legislation coming through from government, and also to promote a more conducive environment for our businesses to thrive and grow. And separate to what we do on behalf of our operators, we have second stream of membership, which is professional advisors and suppliers to the industry, which means that we can then provide a holistic support service to help businesses grow, thrive uh, and transfer from being a single site right the way through to a national. So what we've been doing over the course of the crisis all the way through is making sure that government understands the impact of the decisions it's making on our sector, um, the breadth of hospitality, but then we do divide it up into subsectors come through that are particularly acute or, or particularly hit thing in the different bits of the industry so particularly around curfews scotch eggs uh, and the sort of substantial table meal that those will be up specific uh, and we look at an, a macro level and explain the impact and what the sector has gone through so just to say you know hospitality is, as a sector before the pandemic was 130 billion pound uh, revenue industry so it was the fourth largest industrial sector in the uk bigger than aerospace automotive and pharmaceuticals put together it is now a third of the size it was going into the pandemic so we have lost two-thirds of our revenue large proportion of that obviously will be international tourism spend Tourism is our third largest export earner, but a significant hit on the revenue when we come out of this pandemic on the 12th of April. For 10 months out of the last 14, our businesses will have been closed by legislation without any revenue. Sadly, that means that we've got 660,000 fewer people working in the industry. And in places like the Southwest, that's a large seasonal workforce that has not been stood up at key points in the year and is still not really stood up in, in full. Those who are working, even at the height of last summer, 63% fewer hours. And unfortunately, sadly, we've lost 12,000 uh, venues. Now, you, you mentioned at the start, Mike, about the fact that uh, you know, there's a positive atmosphere around pubs um, and the, the pubs have done a little bit better. We're certainly seeing that in the outlet numbers. So we've had a 6% contraction in the pub estate, a 9% contraction in accommodation, and an 18% contraction in restaurants. So it's really independent restaurants that have borne the brunt of it, and town and city centres. And you can see that across the southwest. It's towns like Plymouth and Exeter that have suffered. Uh, the regional uh, areas, you know, the rural venues doing better. Key issues we're working on at the moment reopening so the first part of our roadmap for recovery that we gave to the the government was to get as much of the sector open as swiftly and as safely as possible with as few restrictions as possible it's not just about the date for reopening it's the conditions of reopening too and again if you look back to last summer when we did reopen successfully, even then in the Southwest, although the Southwest was technically full, it was full operating at reduced capacity. And until we get those capacity constraints lifted, that social distancing is lifted, our businesses won't make a profit. So key to make sure that we've got as few restrictions as possible. And as part of that, we're then looking at, you know, how do we reopen events? How do we reopen the nighttime economy? How do we reopen uh, live music, etc.? Looking at uh, passports, the, the discussions about uh, vaccine passports, 
uh, but also test and trace. Um, and then we're looking at recovery. How do we make sure that we can rebuild consumer confidence, get clear messages from the government about returning to work, returning to town and city centres, public transport, and have that breathing space to allow businesses to rebuild a little bit of shattered balance sheets. Key there with pressing on business rates, trying to get that 100% holiday extended. In Scotland and Wales, we've got 100% holiday for a full year. We've only got it for three months. So crucially, if we don't get those restrictions lifted on the 21st of June, you haven't got much breathing space before some business rates bills start to kick in in July. And then it's about rebuilding resilience. The key message and the legacy of this uh, crisis will be the level of indebtedness that our tourism and hospitality sector emerges with. And the, but the pub sector is not immune from that. So it's about making sure we tackle the challenges of rent and rent debt, uh, which could uh, cripple the recovery, the recapitalization as we, we come out to, to repay loans. Uh, and then it's about the structural changes that we need to help our businesses not just reopen, recover and rebuild, but to deliver a renaissance to the country again. So it's about structural changes on Landlord and Tenant Act, business rates, root and branch reform, urban renewal, and also looking at the career structures and, and uh, training that we need to make sure that we are equipped for the, for the future. And then if we do get all of that right, I believe we can go back as the hospitality sector was in 2019 to generating 5% economic growth a year, one in six of net new jobs and a 10 billion pound investment in our high streets. So the return on investment from an, a support for hospitality and tourism will repay itself um, many times over. And particularly in parts of the country like the Southwest where it is the third largest employer, it's such a significant part of the economy, it's around 25% of the total economy down here. We will then be able to, to give a renaissance to the UK and we have a showcase series of events coming up, starting with hosting the G7 in Cornwall in, in July. But we've then got COP26 in Glasgow, the Commonwealth Games, showing what Britain can do on a world stage. And it's our hospitality and tourism businesses that will help us to achieve that. So that's what we're working on in a nutshell, looking at sort of next, the immediate uh, uh, support that's needed, but also looking ahead to the next two years. Kate, that's fantastic. Thank you. I, I know that Mike, if you want to join us on screen as well, is, is keen to ask you some questions. I mean, just to pick up on a couple of things that Kate said there from, from the business uh, rates perspective, Kate, um, we've got Nicola speaking later on. It's it's always such a hot, uh, contentious issue. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what Nicola has to say um, later on from that perspective. I'm sure she'll echo some of your, your comments there. Um, it's also just wanted to point out as well, you know, Robin from uh, Services to Tourism in the in the chat there's just saying thanks from all of us, um, you know, across the hospitality sector for your team uh, and what you do at UK Hospitality with your, your ceaseless lobbying on behalf of the hospitality sector is much appreciated. Um, I'll hand over to Mike. Mike's got a few questions um, just to, to ask Kate now. So fire away, Mike. And yeah, to echo what Ollie said, thank you, Kate, for what you do. Um, UK Hospitality are, you know, at the forefront of what the guys on the ground need and um you know from our point of view we're out and, and seeing operators and it's interesting just how everyone's had very different experiences really you know we talked about late night leisure i think we can talk probably more positively about the return of the village local and um how that i think communities have actually seen how their pub actually operates for them through quite a challenging time um one of the questions i did want to ask is more of actually on the, the lobbying side i know there's been a, a call for a Minister for Tourism, uh, or Hospitality, sorry, and, and really just to see how, how that's going. It seems to be going through Parliament at various stages, and um, I, I don't know if you've got any insight into that. we've got clouds and, and one of the things that we can take away from the COVID crisis is that at the national political level there's a much wider appreciation of what hospitality is. So we've always had a minister for tourism but that tends to look at the very obvious tourist locations, the tourist destinations and also attracting international tourism to the UK rather than looking at domestic hospitality. So um, I think our tourism minister has worked incredibly hard but over the course of the pandemic as we went into it the government pretty quickly realised that it was our high street uh, restaurants, uh, pubs, bars, our community pubs that were going to suffer the most from being closed and set up a new unit within the business department to look after hospitality. And so we have had a minister who has looked after us and had weekly calls with us throughout the pandemic. So I'm sure that that inexorable move towards a hospitality minister will come. We've been very fortunate that we've had three ministers working with us to put pressure on the Treasury 
And it's always about going up into those top levels of government. So at the moment, you've got health cabinet office, which is Michael Gove's team looking at sort of the, the mechanics of government. And you've got the Treasury as well as number 10. So, so that's the quad. You need ministers putting pressure on those four top people who are making the main decisions. Having three departments do it is immeasurably better than one. So I want to have a tourism minister, a hospitality minister and a food minister in DEFRA. Um, and they've been fantastic in supporting us all the way through this. Thank you. And then government support. You know, there's been a huge amount of government support. Um, some say, you know, potentially it's kicked problems down the road. It is what it is. We all work in a marketplace. Um, we, we've talked a lot more recently about what's needed at the back end of this year. You know, I, I think we saw some of the initiatives last year, I suppose, it's out to help out. Probably came for the Southwest, it's Southwest specific. Um, probably at a time where it really wasn't actually needed or, or, or that useful um, because of uh, restricted trade areas and all the usual things. So. Do you think there are things that can be done next year, an extension of furlough over winter, maybe an, ex, you know, an eat out to help out scheme, but off season? Are we being, I, I suppose, a bit selfish, I suppose, from the Southwest saying that? But, you know, there's, there's things that we're going to need in the longer term, about VAT at 5%. You know, that's a huge, huge um, uh, help. Uh, and, and I know the beer duty um, pricing came up in, in Parliament last week. Is there anything in particular that you'd like to see push forward as we look, look ahead? good government support but it all comes to an end at the same time we've now created another cliff edge which is the 30th of june which is why we've got to keep the government to account and hold their feet to the fire to get those restrictions lifted it's a very tight timetable if there's any slippage particularly on that latter date so 12th of april outdoors 17th of may indoors with lots of restrictions 21st of june theoretically trading as normal without restrictions imperative we stick to that because 1st of July all of that support falls away so furlough does continue but you start to pay for it a lot more um, business rates uh, although it's at 67 percent relief it will mean that people start to pay business rates bills from the 1st of July so I'd like to see some of those extended a little bit further to get us towards September and, and certainly looking at sector specific support and then the key one I mentioned you know that this rent debt that is the one that keeps me up all night thinking and worrying about the level of debt the industry's got and that's where i think you need government solutions and we, we'd like to see a recapitalization strategy coming through from the government because you've got two billion pounds of rent debt six billion pounds of government backed debt so sybils bounce backs etc which start to be repayable from may and then you've got government debt in the form of deferred paye and deferred taxes you know, we can have survived the black swan, which was last year, and people will still be in business. But for the next 18 months, that spectre of debt, that of debt, that is going to be the, the grey rhinoceros that runs alongside us and could still knock the industry off track. So do you think the government needs to look at that? And then you're right, VAT is, is one that you could look at for longer because you've got the 12.5% the coming in from, from September. They could look at extending that 5%. And then, of course, you've got it coming to an end in January, just at the point we might be hitting recovery or starting to hit recovery. So I think you need to look at those. Eat out to help out. I think you could look at extending the season. And certainly one of the things that we've talked about is an, a bank holiday at the end of September to help the businesses recover and, and again, extend that shoulder period so vital in the Southwest. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, sorry, I uh, <laughs> turned my camera off uh, randomly there. Thanks, Kate. That, that's really helpful. Um, th there was only other one question I wanted just to raise with you, and I'm not sure if, if, if technically it's something you look at, but um, in the last budget, there was um, some increase in match funding for ACVs um, to support local communities looking at aspects in their own pub. Is that, is that the type of work you would get involved in as well? Did you have any thoughts on, on that? So what's driven by our members so we do keep our top level priorities of the, the really key issues that we need to get nailed VAT business rates reform extending that business rates cap um, those kind of things but we would also then look at providing practical advice guidance and support to businesses who want to move down that that route and also to engage with government about getting that support through so yeah ACVs um, we, we've got a wealth of information on our website that supports people in in that position who might be looking to take over their pub 
or look to the local community or equally supporting businesses who are not wanting an ACV listing because they are concerned about what it might do to, to their pub valuations, which is obviously the flip side of it. So we provide a lot of information and support on both sides. Anything to add? But, um... No, I, 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 I'm, I'm conscious of our time to move on, but I mean, that's fantastic. And thank you for joining us again this morning. Kate will be here uh, around it until the end of the webinar. So please do. I see that there's a couple coming in already um, on the right hand side. Please do have, if you've got any questions directly for Kate, um, please do put them in and we will try to get there within the last 10, 15 minutes of the webinar. Um, I'm going to move things along uh, now, if possible, by um, introducing my colleague, Nicola Murrish. Nicola is an associate uh, and head of leisure rating at Vickery Holman, um, and has very kindly agreed to uh, give us a business rates update this morning, as previously mentioned when we were talking to Kate. Morning, Nicola. Um, business rates you know, are, a, are a highly contentious cost for almost all commercial operators uh, and occupiers, but none more so really than leisure businesses. And in the light of the recent budget um, announced by the Chancellor, we thought it'd be useful to have an update from our in-house expert this morning. So thanks for this, Nicola. Um, and if you're all ready, I'll hand over Lovely, to you. Thank you. Yeah, certainly very much in the um, in the press at the moment, obviously business rates, very hot topic. So good morning. Um, my name is Nicola Murrish. I'm an associate here at Vickery Holman. I focus solely on business rates in the ledger sector. So I'm, I look at pubs, hotels, holiday parks, self-catering premises throughout the Southwest region. Um, Certainly, business rates has featured a lot in the news over the past 12 months, so I thought I would summarise the past, the present and the future of business rates. By way of a background, rateable value is meant to reflect the rent someone would pay for the premises on a given valuation date. For retail office and industrial premises, there is plenty of rental evidence in the market for the valuation office to use. However, for pubs, hotels, not restaurants, but caravan parks, holiday lets, they're all valued having regard to trading history, having regard to three years accounts and establishing a fair, maintainable level of trade. This is important to remember when I discuss the revaluation in a moment. So in terms of the past and where we were in early 2020, we had a revaluation due in April 2021. The critical valuation date had already passed in 2019 and premises had been valued based on trade during 2016 to 2019. Questionnaires had already been sent to all businesses in 2018 and 2019, which sought accounting information for that three year period. We had a 2020 multiplier, which forms the basis of calculating rates bills. That was 51.2 pence in the pound for large premises, that's over 51,000 RV, and 49.9 pence in the pound for smaller premises. This had crept up from 47.9 pence earlier in the list. We had a retail relief scheme which granted a thousand pounds off retail rates bills. As the COVID crisis hit us in March last year, it was the retail relief scheme, which was used as a mechanism to rapidly provide the 100% rates relief to the retail, leisure and hospitality sector. In March, 2020, the 2021 revaluation was also postponed initially until 2022, but then later confirmed as being 2023 with the aim of providing some certainty to ratepayers. We found almost immediately that the valuation office had a new resource of staff who were taken off working on the revaluation, which enabled existing checks and challenges to be resolved much more swiftly. I think we had a record of one case being dealt with in two weeks, um, which previously we had timeframes of more like 12 months. So it was, it was a bit different. Um, a number of COVID measures were introduced, which relied on the rateable value to qualify and calculate, and the local restrictions support grants or grants of 10,000 to 25,000 pounds being awarded. So in terms of the present, in November last year at the spending review, the government decided to freeze business rates multipliers. So for 2021-22, they remain at the 51.2 pence for the larger premises and 49.9 pence for smaller. During the budget earlier this month, it was announced that the government would provide additional business rates support for eligible retail, hospitality and leisure premises. So again, as Kate's already mentioned, we've seen the retail, the expanded retail discount extended for a further three months at the 100% level. And after that, from 1st of July to the end of March at 67% relief. 
and Kate has already said that they're campaigning, campaigning to extend that um, further. The budget also announced restart grants between 8,000 to 18,000. Again, they are determined by rateable value. So in terms of the future, we've got the revaluation, which has been postponed to 2023. So six years from the last one, which was 1st of April 2017. As part of an earlier business rates review, there was a shift from longer periods between revaluation re to being more frequent with the 21 revaluation intending to be four years. And then there was going to be a move to three yearly thereafter. So obviously this recent postponement has extended that out back out to six years. Um, the 2023 revaluation date means that the valuation um, date in terms of how we value premises is April this year, so next month. The valuation office will be relying on three years accounts leading up to next month, so the 2018 to 2021 summers. So that means that the revaluation will be including the 2020 season, which of course saw the early trading period between Easter and July completely lost, followed by a short season with either some businesses doing exceptionally well and over trading for the same periods in previous years, all businesses continue to struggle and obviously with a shorter season. It'll be interesting to see how the valuation office deal with the COVID crisis and the revaluation and how they arrive at their adopted level of fair maintainable trade. 2021 will not help as a comparison as we expect to see a good season as the popularity of the staycation remains. This means that maybe they'll be looking at 2019 and 2018 summers solely. Um, but certainly, I think it's important to remember that, you know, the revaluation when they come out, um, when the new rate of values come out, you know, they should they should be checked. They will need looking at because there are going to be some anomalies without, without a doubt. Um, also announced in the 2020 budget was a fundamental review of business, business rates um, and the final report will be announced this autumn. In summary, then. Um, business rates continue to be a huge burden to all businesses. Existing relief schemes have worked well, enabling a swift response to the COVID crisis last year and provided an existing mechanism to be able to grant 100% rates relief. It will be, as ever, um, important to ensure rateable values are checked and challenges challenged after the 23 revaluation, as we see the anomalies of the 2020 and 2021 seasons um, as we'll need to consider the accounts against what we call the rating hypothesis. Just to finish I've got a couple of case studies here that can just show you what can be done. Um, they're both pubs actually. So looking at the mermaid which we dealt with on the Isles of Scilly we had a rateable value there of 63,000. That was checked and challenged, um, and that saw a reduction to £50,750, which saved the client £29,000. The important one on that one was that he also then fell below the, uh, the £51,000 threshold, which obviously was a different another bracket in terms of COVID grants, so he was um, very pleased. Um, another one was a pub rural location, Devon, I mean, that one, it was clear that the, the, the fair maintainable trade that had been adopted was, well, it was just wrong, completely wrong. Um, and we had a rateable value based on that trade at 65,800. Um, that was reduced to 12,000 pound rateable value. He then qualified for small business relief and is now paying, um, paying nothing. Um, but that, yeah, that was clearly wrong um, and obviously worth, worth checking and challenging. So that's that's all from me. Thank you. Just very quickly, if you stay on the screen, now, you know it's it's interesting uh, when you say start your talk there. Twenty twenty three. Uh, it's been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back till twenty twenty three to give certainty. Um, probably the, the 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 most interesting thing from my perspective is the revaluation date of this year. You know the antecedent antecedent valuation date is going to be taken from 2021. Now, in every you know almost every single one of the at leisure webinars that we've been doing, um, the consensus across the leisure sector has been that this year is going to be very strong um, from a trading perspective. 
um, it's just going to be interesting. I think I just wanted to get your thoughts on what you think would be, whether you think that would be pushed back again in order to, to, to take that out of the equation, really. 2021 is going to be a good trading year. It feels like it's going to be a bit of a sting in the tail if that is the year that the VOA take as your valuation date for, for, for the new list. Yeah, I mean, I can't see how... I can't say how they would push it back yet again. I mean, that would be, you know, that would be quite a shift. Whether they take a, 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 a reduced percentage, I don't know, but it's going to be, a, it, feel, it feels like it's going to be a bit of a sting in the tail, that one, and it's and it's something that might be brought up in this autumn review. Yeah. I mean, certainly, you know, like I said before, when we have a valuation date, which is always two years before the revaluation, they look at three years um, trade, mm. but the most important of those three years is the one closest to our valuation date so the summer season before so we've got a valuation date next month so the closest summer season was obviously last year so last year and this year ordinarily would be the important the important years that they'd be looking at so yeah what are they going to do i don't i don't know is the answer but you know they're going to well, hopefully all eyes. Eyes. Yeah, the history i think it's going to be all eyes isn't it on this um, yeah this review as, as kate says as kate alluded to earlier that, that carries so much importance because business rates is is such a, a, a big burden on all businesses across the leisure sector across all as i said earlier you know across all commercial um occupiers so yeah it would be really interesting to see when that does finally come to fruition it feels like it's been touted forever um, but now finally seems to have been coming to a head. So thanks for giving yeah. us an update this morning. Um, much appreciated. And, and I hope everybody found that one useful. Um, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Mike, um, who's going to run a QA and a with our third contributor of the morning, uh, Dickie Harrison. Dickie is the publican for the Tours Inn, which you can see a lovely photo uh, of below in its beautiful Dartmoor setting. Um, he also operates the kitchen at the Grapevine in Exmouth as well, um, under his Ruby Burger concept. Um, he's previously run the very well-known uh, Exeter pub, which I have frequented on many occasions. I am not ashamed to say uh, the Angel, which is opposite the railway station, um, if any of our audience recognise that one. Um, and uh, also a number of Exeter food and uh, late night leisure venues as well. So welcome to Dickey. Uh, thanks so much for joining us this morning, Dickie. It's really, really appreciated. Um, if you want to come and join us on screen now uh, with Mike, um, I'll hand over to you guys. Thanks, Ollie. Morning, Dickie. Morning. So, can you talk about your background first for the benefit of the audience who are now probably really craving to go to the pub again? <laughs> yeah, I'm the only man probably who's been locked in the pub for about a year um, as we live here now. Um, yep, yeah, basically, I'm Dickie. We are basically we took on the pub in February last year after I sold the lease to the Angel in Exeter after 12 years. Um, we moved into the pub, so we moved out of our house, um, and then we had four weeks trading and then shut the doors. Um, it wasn't quite in the business plan or or expecting. Um, but we do, we do, you know, we feel quite lucky that we, we got in when we did because if that had happened a month later, it would have caused massive problems. Um, but we, yeah, we love, we love our pub and we love where we are. Oh, that's fair enough. I mean, you know, it's certainly quite a start change for you. You know, you've been a city centre operator for, for a long time and you, you've moved that onto the moors. What, was it, what, what was the driver for that? For us, it was, uh, it was lifestyle. So we, you know, my, we were in the city centre and we, um, it was kind of, that was my 30s kind of pub and it was dealing with city centres, late night trade, you know, the DJs, the rum at two o'clock in the morning. Um, we had our daughter and our family, and we decided that we wanted to move back out um, from Devon um, and to the heart of Devon for us was Dartmoor. Um, I love, I'm a publican, that's what I've done all my life. So it was to come back to uh, back to our roots, really. Um, and it's kind of, and it was, it felt, you know, it felt a bit risky, I think, in the city centre as well. I was getting older, um, but we didn't think really that moving out to the country was going to kind of pay dividends so early as a sort of secure lifestyle for yeah. ourselves. I guess you had a bit of a plan when you took on the tours. Um, I guess that accelerated by a lockdown. Yeah. You know, what, what was the situation there? So we, like when we basically, when, when we moved out to the tours, um, we, we kind of saw the opportunity of Bellstone's a beautiful place on Dartmoor. Um, the pub was an e like epic location. Um, and it, you know, it's a tired old pub, and we had the kind of skills behind us to know that we could carry it forward and kind of develop it into a sort of destination venue. Um, 
And then that was the kind of the blessing that kind of came of lockdown because we obviously sold the pub in Exeter, moved out the house, moved into the tours, um, and then suddenly shut down. But then we saw that we had this time ahead of us. So we buckled down and basically spent three or four months redecorating the whole interior of the pub, um, rebuilding the bars, redecorating the rooms. Um, and then it kind of came apparent that outside trading was going to be the thing that was going to be the safe environment to do. Um, and we've got an outdoor shed that opens up onto our sort of garden and the, the kind of onto the moor. Um, it is over the grid up here. So you've got like cows and horses walking around in the beer garden and it kind of drops off into the great green. So we were like, right, let's get out there. So in the last minute, we slapped paint on the shed, got a griddle and a fryer, put a fridge in and um, tapped some barrels and opened up to the summer. And how was the summer? It was mental. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, uh, it was, yeah, it was really busy. It was really successful, kind of more successful than we expected. Obviously, it was, you know, unprecedented sort of circumstances. Um, it was really well received, and because it was all outdoors, it was you know it, it, fe it felt safe and comfortable for our staff and our customers, um, and it, yeah, it was a success. I mean, we had some bumps in the road with because it was the, the shed was kind of the last thing that we kind of expected to be doing, so we had things breaking down, coolers blowing up, and but we got on top of it, um, and it was good to see it. And I, I think without the kind of lockdown, um, we probably I mean, we saw the opportunity in the like with the shed and wanted to do a barbecue area or something like that, but we didn't really expect it to be that successful. Um, so without sort of the lockdown, we probably would have never have done that. Um, and it has, yeah, it's been successful. And then come the end of the summer into the winter, it was a bit more of a struggle, you know, for operators, November, December, um, trying to operate in quite restricted circumstances. Yeah, so then, then it was all changed. I mean, last year we, is kind of an experiment for us because we, we were trying different aspects of the business out and because obviously we'd only got a foot in the door um in october we basically moved out of the shed and back into the pub but then it was full restaurant table service um it's very much a pub here so we kind of we we're trying to create a pub atmosphere but whilst also you, you were basically enforced to be a restaurant um and obviously all the chefs had a whole new menu we created and it's all and it's quite heavy you know the, the wage bill was quite heavy with having to do sort of restaurant service and then by sort of nine o'clock the pub would be empty and wouldn't have the late night sort of or the later drinking um which was kind of the top slice that you needed so we found ourselves working really hard it was busy but we were, it wasn't really making any money but it was it was fun to do it but, um... so we're a little bit over a week away from going again are you opening? Are you opening up the back there? We are. So we've uh, we've used so this this time round, <laughs> January and February was a bit bleak and not much fun for anyone. I don't think um, it was obviously a bit more. I think it was quite serious for all of us. But we basically took the time to redevelop the shed outside. So we've um, put in new extraction systems and made it more of a professional sort of outdoor kitchen. Um, so we're banking on that being successful. And by all accounts, it looks like we're going to have a busy summer. Um, yeah, so we've used that time to develop outside and that's going to be our strength. Um, and I think that will be kind of the secure bit that we've got for the summer ahead. Um, and then we'll be looking to open up inside on May the 17th. I suppose, you know, a, 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 you're, you're a bit over a year then of, of being in occupation out there. Is there anything that you have done that you wouldn't have ever expected to have done outside of, you know, the, the odd times that we've been in? But I suppose we look at the way that some people have gone Way they're ordering food the way people are paying you know looking at a lot of operators have looked at their staff costs and you know how they operate their business in, in closures. yeah i think that i mean we, it's very difficult isn't it because pubs are all um they all got different aspects to them and then if you bring them all together with one brush you can't they're, they're all completely different businesses um we are we, we are lucky with an outside area um and we're a destination country pub so we're actually in ticking the right boxes um, but obviously when you're talking about the city centre um, and then in the summer, everyone leaving the cities, all the students not being there and then um, not being able to, that it's difficult to kind of put them together because their crunch will come at the end of the summer when they get busy in September. Whereas we've got in like the southwest, we're going to have the summer to kind of make our beans for the winter and then our trade will drop off. So then we need to uh, think about that. It is difficult with... Um, 
trying to figure out staff wages against what you're doing because obviously you're having to do different styles of service um, which can increase like your wage bill um, but for us the shed really was something that we didn't expect to happen and that's actually come the forefront of our business at present um, which is good yeah you have to be diverse and kind of think outside the box I guess. <laughs> absolutely I, mean, I think always isn't it um, and, and then I suppose when, when you've had some of the supports that have come through the furlough the bat you know rates relief that type of thing is there anything specific to you that you think would be helpful for the longer term? It's going to be difficult. I think Kate was was, was talking about it, but the a pub pub space. A lot of pubs don't. You know, they make a lifestyle, but they don't make a lot of money, especially if you're just a single operator. Um, and then for a pub to make money, it needs to basically have all of its revenue streams open. So it needs to have a turnover that covers its fixed costs and its running costs. Um, but then to make that bit of profit, you need the top slice, be that B&B, the restaurant, the outdoors. Uh, but if there's any sort of um, constraints on any of those revenue streams, it's difficult for a pub to make that profit. So whilst basically any restrictions are in place of any form, there still needs to be a backup um, until the pubs can run as pubs. Um, so that's what I'd like to see going yeah, forward. I can understand that. I can understand that. And, and then one of the questions that I just saw that was sort of whizzing up on the on the screen vaccination passports being managed by publicans how do you feel about that yeah <laughs> i think there's i mean there's lots of different ideas that get moved around um i'm hoping by the time we get actually to, you know if june the 21st and this is going to be quite crucial if we can take off our masks and put a pint on the bar and have a guy on a guitar in the corner and have that back which would be the dream of everybody um, I'm not quite sure what that will look like yet, but um, I'm hoping that will happen. Um, and by that time, hopefully everyone's been vaccinated pretty much yeah. anyway. Um, I think it's come down to people's common sense and people themselves taking what they believe to be the right or wrong. It's, it's up to them, really, yeah. I think. No, it's, it, it's, it's fair play. I, I remember speaking to a publican at the back end of last year, and they, they were really miserable about having to sort of act as the gatekeeper. Um, because they're so, you know, you're, you're social by very nature. You want customers to come and enjoy themselves. And asking a raft of questions and checking things is actually the complete opposite of really what, what you're about, ultimately. That's it, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? If we have to take ID of everyone having their uh, vaccinations of coming into a bar, then I'm not, you know, it's a bit of an ethical question, which I don't think they can answer yet, so I don't think I will. No, that's fair <laughs> enough. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Um, what we'll do is we'll get Ollie back on um, screen if we can. Could you just hang on and just see if we've got any other queries that have come through yeah. that we can uh, we can put your way? I had one from Dickie, actually, Dickie, if yeah. that's okay. I mean, I, I, we've done, as I said earlier, this is the fifth one of these that we've done. And I think every single operator or operators that we've had um, here on, on the webinar, we've asked whether Eat Out to Help Out was actually... Uh, you know helpful or whether it was a hindrance last year um, and actually the, the most interesting thing about your business is it pretty much everyone we've spoken to has been in the middle of a town or a city you're in a rural location um so you know was was that was that a help and would a return to something like that next winter as as mike was discussing with a uh, with kate earlier actually be of any help to you so the shed outside basically operated as a takeaway um, and we shut right. closed it on Monday and Tuesdays. So it's only Wednesdays that we would have done it, but we decided to not participate in it on that one. Um, it's pretty much because when people come to us, they're coming for the experience of going on the moors for a walk and having a burger and stuff like that. So it wasn't trying to compete or um, but we made the choice not to do that. Uh, Ruby and Exmouth did participate in that and it, and it got slammed. Um, Financially, it was good trading, but I think the idea of bringing lots of people together in an enclosed space in a in the kind of well for Exmouth, the peak busy period of August, wasn't mm. a very good idea in hindsight, um, and it did stretch the staff to the limits. So you know, it did. From my accounts, the yeah, we, disgruntled sort of not, not so much Ruby, but definitely had disgruntled customers yeah. not getting what they wanted after queuing for an hour to get into a building and etc. Um, I think. In a in the winter periods, or when it's quieter, or we're definitely feeling that we're at the other end of this pandemic, fingers crossed, um, then that it, it, it could work. Um, but I wouldn't want to see the kind of 
I don't know, the staff getting that nailed and then no, having no, to do it. No, we've we've well. had a real mixed bag throughout these webinars, to be fair, when we've asked that question. And we, Mike, it's been um, a, a lot of people have actually said it's been more of a hindrance um, than any good. Uh, and yeah. it's probably quite far down the list in terms of long term you know uh help that would be after that 30th of, of june uh deadline that people would actually like to see return uh i think that i think in like the times of like you know january when it's pubs are going to be quiet anyway and it's hard yeah. to get people into the pubs and that, and, and it in a kind of safe much no, safer world and that could that's be interesting um, i've had a we've had a uh looking at the chat panel we've had a question from kev um hi kev by the way he's a he's a, a regular viewer of the at leisure webinars um what challenges this is one for you dickie what uh, challenges do you foresee on customer ordering um, and what are you doing uh, to smooth the process? I assume that that is with the 70, uh, the, the upcoming 12th of April date in mind. So outdoors, are you doing anything to, um, you know, to, to smooth the process of customer ordering? So we, we did, so we basically adopted QR codes uh, at tables for mm. ordering and menus. Um, we do find it quite difficult, particularly with the clientele that we have, um, i.e of devon older locals some of them um what, what the most, who what the most tech savvy is that what we're trying to... <laughs> yeah yeah that's it yeah that's it all, yeah. um so but that's basically backed up with more staff who are taking having to take manual orders and table service um which it, that's the whole process so that you still got a you know you're having to pay and have much more technical kind of outlay on your staff and have more staff to be able to deliver it and it does cause slower um and then, then just to follow up on that really um sue has said balancing safety to give customer confidence with reopening businesses and being able to stay open is a delicate ba balance uh, how do you think you can do this effectively with the financial pressures on you um i think i mean the outdoors is obviously proven to be much safer than indoors um, and then HSE kind of risk assessments um, are really useful to have your COPA risk assessment and obviously they're making sure your staff, for me it's about making sure the staff mm. are comfortable and safe um, and then like we kind of touched on then, you know, it's not our job to be policing the public, we provide the safety measures that we have in place and we can obviously you know, we can tell them what to do, but you've got to kind of, it's also up to the customer to be basically taking any yeah. responsibility as well. Um, so we, we will provide everything that we can on a, on a COPA risk assessment. Um, and it takes a significant element, we're outdoors, is, doesn't it? Away, away, it, it takes a significant element of what a pub is though. It's a social environment. So it is very, very difficult to balance that and stay profitable. That's, that's it. And I think in, um, in December, it was obviously, I mean, it's a washout, I think, across the board because it was so, people just didn't want to go out. It was too much of a bother. They were scared um, and it was so complicated and so restrained that it was more of a bother to go out than to stay at home, really. And that's, yeah, that was the ultimate. You could stay open, but you couldn't actually be no, any sort of no. business on that. Well, no, that I, you know, it's it really is fingers crossed for the 30th of June that we get to that stage, you know, as I, as I, as I mentioned in the, in the intro there, we've got to the stage where we've now been able to do stage one of of, of boris's roadmap uh, which was yesterday we've got past that safely here's hoping that we can get all the way through to the 30th of june um and hope that we can be in a position where everything goes smoothly and we can get to where we want to be um dickie thanks so I, if any more questions come through for you i will fire them your way but thanks so much for joining us this morning it's always really really appreciated on these webinars to have an actual operator um who's got feet on the ground and experience you know active experience of the sector in to contribute so thanks so much for joining us this morning thanks dickie thanks for having me on guys no problem. thanks very much indeed so, yeah. for joining us um i will just very quickly ask uh, Kate if she can come and join us back on screen. Um, I've got an interesting one here from Leslie. I think is is it, I, is it might not even be answerable. This one: Do we know forecast numbers of pubs that might not have survived for the last twelve months? I don't think we know that one, Mike. Do we? Do we? Do we I, I, I can answer. Part that. of your trivia Mike. is that part of your trivia knowledge? Not mine. Um, uh, we. We know that for the last 12 months, we've lost 12,000 sites um, and uh, that would be across hospitality, as I said. Um, you've obviously got uh, a churn because then you'll have some that are, that are sort of reopening again. Yeah. Um, 
I think I've got it broken down off the top of my head for just pubs, but CGA is the data source that, that the industry goes to to get all of those numbers. So if you go to CGA Insights on their website, they'll have the, the basic overview if you want it drilled down for just pubs. Brilliant, thank you. That's what we're thinking. Um, I've got another one here as well. I mean, it will be interesting to see w what proportion of that is directly COVID affected. Um, you know, it's taken from end of January last year to the beginning of uh, beginning of February this year. So uh, you're looking then. Uh, you have a small proportion that would be the the continual churn that you get on an everyday basis. But um, normally in, in the year, you get net closure figures and the higher the net closure, at the moment we're at 46, 46 a day. So during the course of 2020, we were at 30 a day. Um, the first two months of this year, we were at 46 a day. Most of that is COVID driven uh, because the, the numbers of closures and business failures usually is offset by the number of new openings and people taking on a site. So uh, you, you have very low closure figures. What's driving those closure figures this year is businesses closing, nobody taking it over, nobody reopening it, and that is solely COVID driven. Thanks, Kate. I mean, actually, just to just to pick up on that, I think the reality is we don't know the extent of the problem in the pub estates as yet. What's sort of a bit disheartening is, is that if you go back to the end of um, 2019 and the start of 2020, you know, pub closures per week were at the lowest they've been for about 11 years. You know, peak of about 42 a week and I think it was down as low as 19. There's always going to be churn as, as, as Kate said but actually the last year it's been a sort of a holding on exercise for most people and it's only actually when pubs have to open that, that we'll, we'll get the full extent. I, th I think for the southwest we'll more likely see you know a number of pubs become available onto the open market um, probably into July which is off the back of that, that that reopening period in June and then I think we'll see a sort of a, and I don't think there'll be many because actually you know we, we expect a busy season I think there may well be more towards the end of the season into into November yeah. but we'll see that sort of second tranche and you know I think it will be a very difficult winter I think that's been said a couple of times this morning it's actually, it's really not the next four or five months it's actually six months after that that that's really where the you know more work has to be done you know, more support needs to be yeah, no, interesting, Mike, thanks. Across the region as a whole, you've got a contraction of about 5%, but if you're looking at Plymouth and Exeter, you've got a contraction of 10% across pubs and restaurants in, in those town city centres. So those are the ones that are finding it really much more difficult. Yeah. We've had a question here from David um, for, for for Kate uh, and for Mike as well. Uh, what evidence is there on a sector level to justify the 15% plus increases being proposed by pubcos? And at what level of rent percentage increase would you recommend? Who wants to take this one on? Shall, shall I pick up that, Kate? That's a lovely question, isn't it? Um, I think that's come from a, a solicitor who evidently has a client at the moment. Um, <laughs> I think that the truth, David, is, is I'm more than happy to talk to you about that. I think it's it's very difficult to find any evidence, actually, at the moment, for all the things we've literally just been talking about. You know, the last year has been wiped out, ultimately. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm more than happy to, to speak to you direct on, on that particular point. Uh, Kate, I won't put you in the chair unless you particularly want to be in the chair. You said it, it's very difficult to get any comparable evidence at the moment because of uh, the closure of the sector. You, you just have to work it through. I mean, our, our, we normally would do a benchmarking report. We haven't been able to look at that. So so it, it's in, incredibly difficult, not just in pubco world, but commercial valuations. Thanks, Kate. Um, just sorry, I'm just going through our chat thing just to see if there's any further questions. Uh, we, Brian. Sorry, Kate. There's a question from Robin about test and trace, which people might not have picked up on. But yesterday they published the guidance. So a lot of a lot of hospitality businesses hadn't realized that they were going to have to resume test and trace and take booking details when people came into the sites. But they're actually now going to have to do it for every customer, not just lead booker. So that is something that within a very short period of time, people are going to have to have their systems back in place and make sure that they are training their staff to capture all of the booking details of every customer that comes in 
And there's also a new obligation on hospitality businesses alone. We are trying to fight both of these at a central government level. But there is also the requirement that you need to take all reasonable steps to refuse entry to somebody who doesn't give you those details. So people need to be made much more aware of that guidance. It only came out yesterday. Um, and it's not just hospitality. It goes across leisure and attractions. But I think a lot of people will start to get caught out about that. Um, and with all the debate about vaccine passports and, and the idea that we wouldn't want to have that, I think people will forget that test and trace is in effect a vaccine passport in, in all but name um, if you're capturing that amount of detail. Yeah, thanks for highlighting that, Kate. I mean, that, I've, I'm not, I'm, I always miss one question. Every single webinar, I will miss a question. Um, Brian's just come in as well with, uh, are there any statistics yet as to the number of closures that are tied houses as opposed to free houses? Too early. We need to be analysing the CGA data in, in a little bit more detail. Uh, and obviously, we don't yet know what's what's masking it, which is why I think the pub numbers are lower than restaurants. What's masking it is that you've obviously got businesses, individual SMEs within that who um, have failed, but the site will come back into being. So I think it's going to take a while before we work through over the next six months, really what the impact of, of COVID has been on Tide versus free houses. There will be a contraction. Yeah, no, thank you for that. OK, um, I can't see any more unless I've missed anything. I just have a quick trawl through just to see I've missed anything, but I can't see any further questions. Um, Oh, Robin's just coming. Given the failure of the first attempt at test and trace, the new policy sounds like hell personified. <laughs> uh, yeah, I concur with that statement, Robin. Um, I just wanted to end the session really with having uh, Mike and Kate on screen here with your uh, a positive message for 2021. Um, what your sort of positive messages are for 2021. I want. I like to end these webinars on an upbeat manner as much as possible. Um, Kate, we'll go with you first, if possible. awful lot of pent-up demand. Uh, you can see that when you look on Twitter feeds, on Facebook feeds, people are wanting to get back and socialise with family and friends in a safe COVID secure environment initially. Um, and I think, you know, the second positive around that is the vaccine and the pace of the vaccination. We might not yet be able to go on holiday abroad. We have got a fantastic United Kingdom, which we can explore safely. Uh, and the latest stats that have just flashed up on my screen is that, that now half, more than half the population has got immunity thanks to cases and vaccinations. So reasons yeah. to be cheerful, lots of demand, uh, lots of, of vaccination that means we can lift those restrictions safely and get back to normal and get back to the things we enjoy. And thirdly, that it appears that not just in the southwest, but across the, the, the breadth of the UK, we have the sun shining and we're moving into better weather. So, you know, re three reasons to be cheerful. Hallelujah. No, thank you very much, Kate. That's brilliant. Uh, Mike, go on a fire away. Uh, I, I do on genuinely spot. feel it's the resurgence of the, the British pub. You know, I, I think that we've gone through almost a generation of, of people falling out of love with the British pub. And I think we've seen, you know, lots of challenges come from the site. You know, we've seen the growth of restaurants, we've seen the growth of coffee shops. You know, that, that all nips away at what's going on in the pub. So I'm going to be a bit boring about the pub guys. But um, I think actually they, they've just responded so well that people are, it, it, it's, you know, there's a, everyone wants to get back to the pub in some way, shape or form. But I think they'll get a lot of new customers from this. Um, I think it will be a very busy year, but I think we have to have support for next year. I think it's all about next year. Um, I think this will be a very good trading year for operators. No, no two ways about it. Harder, though, for the, the wet lead guys. Harder for the late night leisure. Harder for entertainment. You know, it, that, that has to be looked at. But, um, yeah, operationally, I think everyone just wants to get out realize that we are quite social maybe move away from the um facebook and all of that and go out and uh touch somebody i don't know if that's a good way to finish thank you very much thanks guys i'm sorry for putting it you on the spot i don't usually do that but i've put you on the spot i, I like to end in an upbeat manner um i think that's almost exactly an hour we've done relatively well for time for once usually we're 20 minutes over or we're 20 minutes short so we've done quite well this time i'd like to thank all of our contributors um from today's episode of at leisure kate thanks very much for joining us this morning it's been 
extremely informative and and brilliant you've been brilliant thank you very much nicola marish um as well uh dicky harrison our publican um brilliant thank you dicky for joining us um and of course uh mike easton um as always uh, our in-house pub expert so I, I hope it's been an informative session for anybody who has colleagues or know someone who's signed up but not made it live this morning as always, the Vickery Holman uh, website um, and this session will, uh, the, the Vickery Holman uh, events website will lead you to it, but also it's, it's up on YouTube. So please do check out our YouTube channel um, for a pre recorded uh, version of this. Um, and yeah, if, if you've got anyone that you want to get into contact with uh, from uh, either me or Mike or Leslie in the background who operates our sessions, then please do. Um, I don't know if we have a slide, Leslie, that uh, puts up our emails just for the end there so people can see it on the recording. Um, and yeah, um, many thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, we will see you all again soon. Cheers. <laughs>